thank you, God, for another day to come in your house. For this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, you've led us to green pastures. Lord God, we thank you for still waters. We thank you, God, that we can come in one mind, in the same accord, to praise, to bless, and worship you with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength, because you've been good to bring us back one more time. In you we move, exist, and ever and be today. Oh God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this place. We thank you for our pastor, Lord. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the word you've prepared for us today. In Jesus' name, we want to thank you for what you're about to do. Anoint our pastor afresh, oh God. Make a way for the word of God as we come together, Lord. Hungry and thirsty, Lord, to hear what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, hide him behind the cross. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Come on, just go ahead and shout one more time. Just because he's worthy. Put him on the throne. Lift him high above all other names. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, if you can, you may be, may be seated. Glory to God. See what so many people fail to understand or don't understand, Lord, is that God's world is a spiritual world. And if you're going to be part of his world, you got to get used to the world of the spirit. There's no other way you can fellowship with God or worship God but in spirit. Jesus said the day is coming and now is when those that worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. Glory be to God. So to the only, there's only one way to get in the spirit, and that's to get above your flesh. Get above. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You got to get out of yourself, out of your flesh, out of your bondage, out of this uh, clay that we are clothed in. And allow that spirit within you that God breathed in man from the very beginning to be released out of the cage of this bondage of the body of sin. And let him soar and let him fly and let him ascend because that's why you have a spirit. There's only one reason God gave you a spirit and that's to fellowship with him. That is to ascend on the wings of the wind or the breath of the Almighty, hallelujah, and uh, ascend to where He is in realms that you don't understand, I don't understand. His ways are uncomprehensible. They are not perceivable. They are unexplainable. Hallelujah. His thoughts are so outrageously far above ours and His ways above ours. Our problem is we try to put God in a box of our carnal understanding. Glory to God of our side. And you can't do that. Hallelujah. God's bigger than your and my peanut brain. Hallelujah. So the only way you can get up and touch uh, the wings of the wind, as it were, of his breath, that spirit is to be released from yourself. And this is where God gives us the demonstrations of the spirit. You see, you can't see the Holy Ghost. Did you see that? No, you cannot see breath. Breath is invisible, but it's oh so real. You cannot see the wind of a hurricane 
You can't see the actual wind. But you can see the wind by how it moves that which is visible. That's how the Holy Ghost is. You can't see the Holy Ghost. But you can see what the Holy Ghost is doing by how He's breathing upon the trees that are planted by the rivers of water. Have you ever been, uh, ever been walking down the street and you're minding your own business and out of the blue, here comes a, a plastic bag twirling up and down, dancing as if it's a living thing. But there's something that is making it move and you can't see that something. That, that's... Uh, but you can see how that something is moving by the visible object that it is breathing through. And that's how we see the move of the Holy Ghost. As it moves on us and releases us from the prison house of our own carnality and our bondages and our pride where we can let go and be released into realms where we find deliverance. <sighs> as long as I am pastor of Seven Pillars Church, we will never let go of the demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. I said never! Never! Whooshai at I've had people over the years tell me, you won't grow. Your church will never get big if you pray like that, if you shout like that, if you travail and groan in the spirit like that, if your saints are acting crazy and running around the building and shouting and shaking and stomping and treading and dancing and running and leaping over the pews and climbing the walls almost, you'll never grow. And I said, I don't care about growth. I've never cared about growth, ever. Any church I've ever pastored, growth is the, the farthest thing from my mind. He is the only thing in focus. His purpose, His will, His presence. And if we are three people here and He is here, I'm happy. Hallelujah. Because I would rather have Jesus than anything, including a bunch of dead people. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. We were here last week in Hebrews chapter 6. The lesson didn't get recorded, a little glitch in the system. I'm going to do a, a short cap, recap, and good for those of you who were not here, you'll get the recap so that you will understand where we're going. And the rest of you who were here, guess what? You're going to hear it again and think like you didn't hear it the first time. <laughs> Glory. And I'm in verse 17. This verse blows my mind. We're in God, not so very willing, but feeling pressured. Is that what your translation says? Mine either. We're in God, willing more abundantly. That word abundantly simply means super abundant. It means a great, great deal. It means far more and beyond. God willing, God desiring, God wanting to abundantly above and beyond. God zealous, praise God, to show and to reveal unto the heirs of promise. See, we got a very strange picture of God like God sits on his throne and hides 
all of his mysteries under his seat. And is not willing to show and to expose and to reveal to his chosen ones what his purpose and his plan is. That is a wrong image of God. God hungers to open your eyes. God hungers to show you himself. God hungers to reveal and expose his will and his purpose unto his chosen people. He has always hungered to give to show, to expose, blessed be the name of Jesus. But somewhere along the way, we got a mentality in our brains that God is mean. That God does not want to tell you anything. That God is a closed book. And belongs to an elite society. That you have to do a a gajillion mental and spiritual gymnastics to be part of. Wrong. God willing more abundant. God willing, God thirsting, God desiring. I want to show you. It is my hunger to show you. I want to reveal something to you. I want to open your eyes. Hallelujah. That's what it's saying. God willing more abundantly to show, to expose, to reveal unto the heirs of promise. Who are these heirs of promise? My Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, probably verse 7 or 8, somewhere there, it says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be to him a God. And he shall be my son. Oh, that's summit. That's summit material right there. (laughs) Hallelujah. That's part of the summit. uh, To him that overcometh, he will inherit everything. Now, when I went to school, everything meant nothing excluded. It meant nothing taken away. He that overcomes, he will inherit all things. And I will be to him a God And he will be my son. There's nothing beyond that. This this amazing sonship of the inheritance of all, including kingdom. So to these ones, to the heirs of the eternal promise, to when God said, I promise this, I promise This is my destiny for you. I promise that this is my place for you. I promise this is what I've called you unto. But I want to expose it. I want to reveal to you more abundantly to the ears of promise the immutability, the unchangeableness, the non-transferableness. The immutability unchangeability of his counsel. He confirmed it with an oath. In verse 18 it says that, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge and lay hope upon the hope set before us. Now, I told you last week, and let me explain a little bit more in detail. This God 
who has an intense longing and desire to reveal unto us the unchangeableness, the immutability of his counsel. That word counsel means purpose. It means plan. It means determination or something that is determined. God has a determined purpose for Brother Charlie. God has a determined purpose for Brother Ken. God has a determined purpose for Sister Cheryl. God designed that purpose. It is eternal. It is immortal. It is unchangeable. And he took that purpose and he surrounded it with an oath. That word oath means to put a fence around. He protected it. That's why you see... I wish somebody would shout to the living God. He took the counsel, his determined purpose that he spoke into being back in eternity past, before time even began, and he didn't just speak a promise, he oathed it. And that word oath means to swear seven times. God swore a complete oath. He swore an oath through the blood and the fire. He swore an oath through the water. He swore an oath through the incense. He swore an oath through the candlestick. He swore an oath through the table of showbread. He swore an oath through the Ark of the Covenant. He swore an oath through the mercy seat. So not, no matter where you are, where you are in your expression, where you are in your experience, where you are in your journey, that oath is in place. That oath still stands. That Somebody got to help me preach here today. God did not just speak the determined purpose over you and say, that's it. God took that purpose and that seed, that embryo of life, and he put it inside a protection. He put it inside a fence. Now we may run to and fro and round about and kick the fence and buck God and do all kind of things. But let me tell you something, saints. I don't care how weak you think you are, how much you feel like you cannot make it, how much you feel like you cannot go on. God has got a fence around His purpose. All you've got to do is choose to get inside of that fence. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We're all tempted to live outside the garden. When God created Adam, male and female, it says he put them inside the fence. He put them inside the garden because it was within the fence line of the Garden of Eden that God said, here is where you will find my purpose to be fruitful and to multiply and to replenish the earth and to have dominion. You will not find it outside of my fence. My purpose cannot be a reality without side of that fence. You've got to be inside the fence of God's oath. Are you with me? Woo! Okay, that was last week's sermon. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You see, we're all scoundrels. You're all a bunch of scoundrels. I'm a scoundrel. 
We're all worms and not men. That's what the Word of God calls us. Uh, we all try to wiggle our way through any little crack we can outside of the fence of God's purpose. Let, let, let's get out of the oath. Let's get out and just wiggle around here in the freedom of the world just a little bit. And I'll just wiggle my way back in again when I'm good and ready. But you see, God's purpose for your existence cannot be a reality outside the fence line. This is what people have forgotten. This is why so many people that I personally know, they've gone crazy. They've gone nuts. They're, they're, they're like, oh, praise God, I'm free. Let me have my freedom. Let me get outside the fence line and, and enjoy the freedom of the world outside of Eden. And God says, have at it. But my promise, my determined purpose awaits for you within the fence. It is within my promise. And all you've got to do, you see, God made a promise to Abraham. He said, in blessing, I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thee. And he told that to Abraham when he had no seed. And he was already starting to get old. He's like, okay, well, that's a nice promise. And he waited patiently. But the promise, and, and God fenced his promise in by an oath. The Bible says, just in the few verses above where you just read, it says there that because God could swear by nothing greater, he swore by his own name. If he had sworn on anything uh, uh, mortal or anything earthly, he could have broken the oath. But he can't break the oath that he swears by his own name. Because that's eternal. There's no end to the power of that name. So God could not swear by anything great. He could not make the oath. He gave him a promise or he gave him that this is my purpose for you. You are going to be the father of many nations. But then he sealed it with an oath. He sealed it with a promise. He put a fence around it. Now, uh, Abraham, he could have just gone ahead and, and sat there for the next 20 years and say, well, God's going to make me a father of many nations. <sighs> I wonder when this is going to happen. And he's starting to get older and older and older and older. And <laughs> And he's starting to slip down, you know, and he's thinking, well, it's not happening yet. Nothing's happening yet. That's what got, got Abraham in trouble. Trying to redeem God's plan. Trying to make God's plan happen in a way that he could see it happen. And there's still trouble in the Middle East today because of his stupid mistake. Let me not go there. But you know what he had to do? Abraham couldn't just sit there and say, God gave me his purpose. God gave me his determined plan for me, which was out of me. There's going to come a nation and not just one nation, but many nations, many tribes are going to come out of me. That was God's purpose. And then God fenced it and he swore it. I swear it by my own name. I fence in my determined purpose. Nothing will change it. Nothing will affect it. Except, Abraham, if you don't act upon it. Abraham could have said, well, God made the promise. So God's got to do it. But you see, the promise couldn't be fulfilled without Abraham taking action. There had to be an act of obedience and an act of faith. 
I know of people down through the years, they say, oh, well, bless God, God's bereaved covenant, and God's bereaved covenant can't change, or whatever. God said it in eternity past, so it's going to happen. So, you know, why, you know, I'm just going to go to the bar, and I'm going to get drunk, and I'm going to go to the world, and I'm going to enjoy myself. Because God's spoken it anyway, so if God's already said it, and God's already sealed it in, then it's going to happen no matter what I do. He's the one that chosen. I didn't choose. He's the Almighty. <laughs> doesn't work like that Abraham could have said well let me just go and enjoy myself with all the concubines of the land and go have fun Uh uh-uh he had to go at a hundred years old and have an intimate union with Sarah if he had not had that intimate union with Sarah the promise would never have come into reality. He had to get inside the fence. He had to climb into the promise, realizing that this promise is not being generated from me. It's being generated from the one that I'm surrounded by. The one that I have chosen to live in and through. Am I making any sense to anybody? You see, saints, that purpose is not going to be a reality in your life and in my life until we step inside the fence of God's eternal purpose and promise for our lives. Okay, is that clear? Moving on. All right. That by two immutable things, verse 18, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong, and I told you last week, Forcible, a boisterous, a mighty, a powerful, valiant consolation, or a great, great, loud hope. Hallelujah. Great consolation, comfort, who have fled for refuge, listen now, to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. See, hope that is, that is seen is not hope at all. Well, I've been told for years that God's purpose is on me and He wants me to be in a bride and go make it to Mount Zion and I don't see it happening. But hope that is seen is not hope. A hope is a thirst It is a desire. It is a hunger for something that you can not see. Bless the name of the Lord. God said, I am more than willing to expose, to show you, to reveal unto you this immutable, unchangeable, uh, determined purpose that I sealed with an oath for those of you who have run to lay hold of the refuge that is inside of that fence because there living in this place is where you find hope you know when we lose hope Stepping outside of the fence. This is when we lose hope. When it seems useless, helpless, hopeless, disparity, disparagement, discouragement, depression takes a hold of God's people because we are sitting here getting older like Abraham. There goes one more tooth. Rocking ourselves into agedness. Glory be to God. And it seems like all hope is fading away. No, it's not. It's in the fence. In the fence of God's purpose. All right, let me read on. Oh, I love the word of God. Which hope... We have as an anchor 
of the soul. Both sure and steadfast. And which entereth into that within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Woo! Can somebody please shout? I don't hear anybody! Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, unmovable, and which entereth, that's the hope, that enters into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, once upon a time, there was a tabernacle. God gave his people that tabernacle and later on a temple laid out in similar fashion. This tabernacle had a courtyard, it had a holy place, and it had a place within the veil. In that place within the veil, there was the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. And nobody could go in there except the high priest. And then, only one day a year, Access to the presence of God was closed. There was no access for common man to go through the courtyard and the holy place and enter into that within the veil. That hope was not there. God sent his son Jesus and through the renting of his flesh the veil was rent in twain oh, somebody shout for what he did hallelujah I was talking to a minister a little while ago and he said to me Oh, there's a young man that I've been counseling. And this young man feels like he's not experiencing God and the presence of God the way he would like to. And so I said to him, this is what the brother told me. I, so I said to him, well, brother, do you feel his presence once a year at least? And the young man said, well, yeah. Yeah. But that's not enough, he said. I, I want more. And this, this minister that was talking to me, he said, but don't you know, the high priest only got to go in there once a year. And then he had to crawl under the veil. And so, brother, you know, you got to go up and you got to crawl under that veil so that you can enter into that place. And I said to him, brother, what veil are you talking about? He said, the veil, the veil up there in the holy place, the most holy place. And I said, oh, you mean the one that was rent? Somebody shout! Hey, shout out Abahaya. Man, I feel the power of God. Somebody... He said, whoa, 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 what do you mean? I said, brother, there's no veil. Unless you're a Jew and you've sewed it up. And this is what a lot of Christians have done. They've sewed up the veil. 
And they keep on living the law. Keep on going through all the gymnastics to try. I gotta try to get into the most holy place. And this is where you lose your heart. Hallelujah. There is only one thing that stands between me and the face of my father. And that is my mediator. Jesus. He is the veil, as it were. He is the one that stands before the father and brings me through himself. It's like walking through him. And so that through him, through his work, through his accomplishment, I can see my father. I can touch my father. Hallelujah. We are accepted in the beloved. We are accepted by the father through and in the beloved. His name is Jesus. That's the hope. All I've got to do is come through Him. Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. You want to come to the Father? Just walk through me. Come through me. Come through all that I am. And I will show you. Through me, I will show you my Father. Praise the name of Jesus. Okay, let me explain something. Am I making sense so far? So there's Jesus, my faithful high priest, the one whose flesh was rent. Glory be to God so that he could be the only thing. So the veil could be rent and he could stand there uh, making the way for me to my father. I can't see him. Unless I see him through Jesus. You can try to do every kind of spiritual gymnastic you want. Try and do all of the meditations and yogas and, and whatever else the church out world out there is introducing today. All of a sudden Jesus is not enough. But I'm here to tell you he is enough. Yes. He is the all. Glory be to God. He did it all. He secured it all. It's only through Him and by Him. Reading all, let's go back up to uh, verse 19. Which hope we have. Woo! Glory be to God. As an anchor of the soul, both sure and and steadfast and that which entereth into that within the veil. Um, glory to God. Brother uh, Lewis, if you wouldn't mind, stand up on that chair. Uh, face the people. Oh, the word hope is the Hebrew word, and the Hebrew and Aramaic is tekvi. Tekvi means to cast cords, to cast cords. This is the meaning of the word hope, and twist them. Together, twisting the cords together makes the cord stronger. The more cords, the more twisting, the stronger the hope. Now, since that be true, he said, 
This hope that we have, see, there are seven realms of hope. There are seven classes of hope. There's a class of hope for every level of experience in your growing up in the experiences of the statue of Jesus Christ. This hope that I'm talking to you about is the hope that goes inside the veil. This hope that I'm talking to you about is the hope, but let me read your scripture. Hold, hold right there, brother. Go across the page uh, to chapter 7. I'm getting ready to explain hope to you. Because somebody in here needs hope. I know that somebody is me. I need hope. So maybe I'm just preaching to myself here today. In Hebrews 7 verse 19 says, listen, for the law made nothing perfect. That word perfect means complete. The law could not complete anything. The law could not finish the work. The law could not consummate or bring you and I into intimacy with the Son of God. The law, praise God, could not consecrate. The law could not finish. The law could not fulfill. That's the meaning, all meanings of this word perfect, perfect. The law made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope did. By the which we draw nigh to God. Somebody's not hearing me this morning. It is this hope, this highest realm, if you can call it a realm, highest class of hope that goes inside the veil. Now, when I got saved, I got the blood of Jesus down here at the brazen altar. I got hope. Yes, I did. When I got the Holy Ghost, oh man, I got more hope. When I got baptized in Jesus' name, I got even more hope. And when I got up here, got intercession and travail and started to feel the heartbeat of Jesus, I got even more hope. When I started going to the Word and the 66 bowls, knobs, and flowers of the candlestick of the seven lamps revelation started to go like popcorn. I got more hope. When I was able and led to eat the bread, and, 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 and the word became a living experience in my life, I got more hope. I learned to come under an authority that was beyond my own. I got more hope, but there is the highest hope the hope. In his mercy. This is the hope of the better covenant. It is the hope, praise God, where we can look and say, the law did not finish, cannot finish, cannot complete the work that God started in me. Only he that began that work can finish that work. Jesus started the work. He's going to finish the work. Take thee. Woo! Blessed be the name of Jesus. It means a door, an attachment, a cord. It means to patiently wait for and to bind together by twisting. So here I am, walking through life. And God gives me a revelation of that picture we saw up there before. Of his determined purpose 
and His promise. This is the hope within the veil now. This is the hope beyond. This is the hope that's so far beyond you and me, you can do nothing about it but believe. Only trust can get you to this place. Glory be to God. And so He shows you that. And you take that anchor, that hope, and you get ready to catch. And you cast it within the veil. From the, to the very face and mouth of the one who spoke the promise. The one who spoke the purpose. You cast that hope up right up to where his presence is. His glory is. And this is how you keep going. You go through life. Oh, God just showed me something. And I believe it. And I have my hope in him. And you cast it up. Glory be to God. And you keep on casting up the hope and you keep on casting up the hope and you keep on casting up the hope but they're not twisted they're still weak links but every time I pray every time I dance Every time I shout, every time I twirl around, every time I worship God, somebody shout! Look what happens to my hope. Look what happens when I praise, when I pray, when I travail, when I intercede, when I repent, when I do all of these things. Casting up my hope to where the mercy is. All of a sudden, there's nothing going to break my hope. Because I've twisted, I've twirled, I've shouted, I've glorified, I've prayed, I've demonstrated, I've run, I've got down, I've repented, I've done all I know to do. Hallelujah. And with every twist, with every turn, with every shout, with every demonstration, with every clap, with every raised hand, with every stomp foot, with, I shy, with every scream from my voice, I'm twisting the cords. I'm twisting the cords. Somebody shout in here, please. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. See, people lose their hope. When they stop casting the anchor within the veil. You know why they stop doing that? Because they think that place within the veil is not for them. It's only for an elite one or two. Who are allowed to enter into that place. And every time we think that. Every time we act like that. We slap the face of Jesus and we tell him in so many words, your work was not enough. I've got to add to your work because it wasn't complete. However, the twisting is work. The travailing is work. The praying is work. The repenting is work. This is all work. But it's not a work, praise God, that you are doing that can make you righteous. It is a work that is casting up your hope to the one. And it, I saw you. I wish somebody would praise him in here today. To the 
one who is the only ac- can, is the only one who can give me the access to my Father. I am only accepted in the Beloved. N- nothing else. Am I making any sense? All right, brother, you can sit down for a second. I'm going to bring you back here in just a moment. Can I just preach just a little bit? Go with me in your Bibles, if you will. And I won't keep you here all day, but a little bit. Joshua chapter 2. Oh, glory. Blessed be the wonderful name of Jesus. Joshua chapter 2. Give me the next slide. I forgot to. There's the anchor. Forgot to put my anchor up there. There's my anchor thrown up into the mercy seat. Into that which was within the veil. That's my hope, saints. I have hope today. Not because of me, but because of Him. I have access through Him to come and stand before the Almighty. And when I come that way, He sees nothing but His Son. And when He sees His Son, He adopts you as His own. And we become part of the adoption of the sons of God. Oh, there's so much to tell you about this. This is so exciting. All right. I'm in Joshua chapter 2. You remember the story. When the spies went into Canaan, right? And they were told to go and spy out the land. And so they did. And uh, they ended up in the walls of Jericho. And they were kind of uh, uh, on stealth. They laid low. They probably had their hoods down like this. And they were spying out the kind of people and the entrances and the weaknesses in the wall and whatever. They ended up at Rahab's house. Rahab just loved this woman. She was the great-great-grandmother of King David. Imagine who this woman was. What, what got her to such privilege? What was it that got her to this place of such honor? To be mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. Ha <laughs> ha. Mercy. This harlot she's called. This commoner, this Gentile, she wasn't Jew, she wasn't clean, she was all unclean, she was all Gentile, and she was all wrong. But there she is, read the genealogy of Jesus, and there is Rahab. That blows my little peanut brain. There's this little Gentile common harlot lady and she had an inn she was an innkeeper probably people went in to the inn to play hanky panky and her inn was on the wall she had a window right on the wall high on the wall of Jericho and she took the spies in and she took them up to the roof of her house and she hid them under the bushels and when the men of the city came knocking on the doors, poo, 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 poo. Uh, yes, good evening. Would you like a room? No, we're looking for those spies. Have you seen those spies? I don't believe I have. I don't, not quite sure what happened to them. And they took off. And then she went up and she did something remarkable. Hallelujah. I'm in Joshua. I'm in chapter 2. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 15. Then she let them down by a cord. Ah, ah, somebody got a shout. Ah, 
Shabohoya. She let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days, until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may ye go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made us. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread. I want to tell you here this morning that that word line is the Hebrew word tech they hope twisted. Take this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's house home unto thee. Now listen, give me the next picture. There was Rahab. She had a take thee line this was a line that had been woven and twisted over time it had to have been a very strong cord because it let down heavy spies who knows how long she'd been weaving her cord who knows how long that saints i feel such power of god somebody's got to shout in here Come on, lift up his hey. Who knows how long she'd been twining and twisting this cord for the day that she was going to need it. Not understanding what it was for, where it was for, when it was for. And then the spies came and she let them down by that cord. Hallelujah. And the spy said, take this cord, this line, this tech they cast it out of your window. Cast it out into what you do not see. But let me tell you something, Rahab. There is a promise here. There is a promise of a purpose of God for you. If you take your hope and you throw it out the window and you throw it into the mercy of God when we come into the land and we see that line and we see that we see that hope out of your window you will be saved you will be spared you see saints we go through life trust me I think I know a little bit about life we go through our pains and our disappointments we go through people rejecting you and misunderstanding you Calling you names, they don't even know you. People calling you and your church and your work and your ministry, all kind of stuff. And they've never darkened the door. They wouldn't have a clue. And you feel the pricks and you feel the gouges and you feel the death and you feel the hate. But just keep weaving. Hide of us just, just, just keep weaving. Because one day, glory be to God, this hope is going to be your very redemption. Let me show you that in the Word of God, and I'll close. Go to Romans. Romans chapter 8. I don't know. Am I speaking double Dutch today? or Are you understanding what I'm saying? 
I'm in, I'm in Romans. I'm in chapter 8. And I'm going to read for you verse 24 and 25. Romans 8, 24, 25. For we are saved by tech thee. By hope. Now this hope and this salvation is not your original salvation. This is talking about the salvation to the uttermost. In the context of this verse. He's talking about the redemption, the salvation to the uttermost. Yeah. And he says, we are saved to that place within the veil, as it were. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope in that which we cannot, which we see not, then do we in patience wait for it. So here, Rahab put her tekvi out of the window. She didn't know when the Israelites would come into the land. She had no clue. And her scarlet thread hung out the window, that thread that had been woven, that thread where she had done an act of faith in uh, allowing the spies to escape through her hope. She had done an act of obedience to the purpose and the will of God. And here it was, cast out into the unknown. I don't know the day. I don't know the hour. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know what's going to happen here. I don't know anything, but I have. I saw it. But I got hope. And when the Israelites came finally, and they marched around the city 13 times in total, and they made the silver trumpet uh, blast, and they shouted with the shout, all the walls came down except where the hope was. One part of the wall remains standing because of someone who dared have hope in God's determined purpose. Sealed with a promise. If you do this, this is what will happen to you. And God honored that woman so much so that she became the bearer of the seed of the Mashiach. She brought forth a son. Hallelujah. I got hope today. I don't know about you. Why should we not have hope? When God has spoken, it is not retrieved. When God speaks His determined... Saints, listen to me. Once God released His determined purpose out of His mouth and took His very own name... The power of that name, the character and the authority of that name. And fenced in that purpose, there is no demon, no devil, no spirit, no human, no circumstance, no church, no religion, no friend, no foe, no neighbor, no husband, no wife, no family member, no circumstance, nothing! Can separate you from God's purpose. Hallelujah. Just jump in it. Cast out your core to hope. Say, I don't know what's inside this fence. I don't see. You don't have to. Just cast the cord. Cast the anchor into the mouth of the one who spoke it. I believe in your mouth. 
My hope is in your word. David said over and over and over again. My hope is in your word. Hallelujah. If God said it, hope in it. And next time you hear what he says again, cast up another cord. And then cast up another cord. And then every opportunity you get, twirl. Shout. Dance. Clap. Hey, sorry. Raise your hands. Stomp. Shout. Pray. Weep. Intercede. Travail. Glory be to God. Whatever the Spirit of God is breathing on you to do. Do it. And do it with all your might. And every time you do, there's one more twist. And that cord. One more thread strengthened in your hope and what he has done and what he has yet to do. I can look at myself and say, you know what? I thought I was strong. But I realize I'm weak. I thought I had more. But I realize I'm poor. I thought I was clothed. But I realize I'm so naked. I thought I was honorable, but I found I'm so wretched. I thought I could see, but I realize I'm blind. And I realize I need that mediator. Because no matter what I do, I cannot ever make my father happy with anything I can do. It's not possible. That's why there was only one who could. And there's only one who did. And his name is Jesus. He did it for me. Because I couldn't do it. God put man under a law that was impossible to keep. Why? So the law could be their schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. That's what Paul said to the Galatians. The law was a schoolmaster. To bring them to Christ. Because they had to come to the place where they realized it's not working. It's not perfecting me. It's not changing me. It's not dealing with my flesh. Praise God. All Everything's outward. Outward washing. Outward applications of blood. But on the inside, that rotten, wicked, old, fallen, Adamic nature still brews. And that's where I need Jesus. I can do a lot of outward things, but I cannot touch my own spirit. I can do a lot of outward things, but I cannot touch my own soul. I cannot change my inner man. Only He can do that. Through and by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. And so it's by casting my hope into that which is within the veil where He stands the eternal mediator between me and my father as I cast, uh, put that, the anchor picture back, will you please? If I cast my, my anchor up there where he is, and twirl, and praise, I believe, I trust, I know, glory be to God, if I jump inside the fence of your promise, I can live in your determined purpose and become all you have purposed for me to be. Not because of me, but because of you. Hallelujah. You know what, saints? You are looking at a person who is going to be all God has purposed for him to be. I am determined that I will hold on and I will hope in Him 
my salvation, my only redeemer, and he will get me to my final destination because I hope in his word. I twist and whirl and twirl over the word of God.